and Deuteronomy uh, chapter 8 this evening. Sunday nights through the Bible, Genesis to Revelation, and we pick things up in the middle of uh, Deuteronomy uh, chapter 8. We pick things up in verse 11, and uh, I'm going to jump us back a verse. But let me just kind of recap for a little bit on where we are and what we find ourselves in the middle of here. Wait a second. I've got a major crisis going on here. I'll tell you about it in just a moment. Oh, my. Okay, we got it. The stopwatch was malfunctioning. Do you know I have a reoccurring dream? I have a reoccurring dream. It doesn't happen every often, probably twice a year. I have two big ones. And uh, one of them is, you know how these fear things, but one of them is I preach until every one of you are forced out of the room. It's like hour number four. And it's funny. Uh, uh, some of you leave a little early. I know you by face. I, I know God has revealed to me your commitment to the word of God and, and me as your pastor. I know the people that last all the way till the end and the falling over in the aisles. And uh, there's another one. But I, that's enough. Uh, we don't need to reveal all the secrets uh, this evening. So anyway, here we are. Deuteronomy chapter eight. Children of Israel, right on the east side of the Jordan River, opposite Jericho, where they're going to begin their conquest of the land of Canaan that God has given to them. Moses is in the middle of his uh, second of five sermons that he delivers to them on the single subject uh, of obedience. And in chapter 8, as we began it last week, we noticed that there were two great words that Uh, summarize the chapter because they're repeated over and over again in the chapter. And that is, number one, the word remember, and number two, the phrase don't forget. They're about to head into in moving from the wilderness where they've been for 40 years. Egypt was no picnic. There were slaves in Egypt. So they enjoyed some level of prosperity, but they ate the simplest of foods and they were slaves, slave labor, not all the 400 years, but for a good portion of the latter part of it. They go out into the wilderness. God keeps them fed. He keeps them clothed, but it's a pretty tough environment. Now they're going to go into the promised land and they're going to become prosperous materially as well as spiritually overnight. They're going to have homes, they're going to have wells, they're going to have orchards, they're going to have minerals, they're going to have stuff. They can't even dream of what's coming their way. So they're about to experience an instant prosperity in their life. As we saw last week in the first ten chapters of verse 8, it wasn't like God threw... Listen, you don't throw people, unprepared people, into instant prosperity. This is one of the problems with inheritances. If a child is not, their character is not developed to handle a substantial inheritance, you can hardly do anything worse to them than to leave them a great estate because you'll give them enough to kill themselves with. So a wise parent, and and God is a parent, he's our heavenly father, he knows how to prepare us for even material blessings that are going to come our way, include spiritual blessings too, by developing character in their lives. Now, we know the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, what it was designed to accomplish in the first generation of of the children of Israel that came out of Egypt, and it was to accomplish their death, basically. They were not going to, because of their lack of faith, inherit the promised land. So why why the 40 years for the second generation? To develop within them the consciousness Uh, on a daily basis that they are completely dependent upon God for their future and for their livelihood, for their everything. And so he spent 40 years preparing them for this prosperity. Boom, they're going to have it overnight. Now, there are in one of the uh, in, in in having this great material prosperity that's going to come their way, they're going to face a couple of great temptations immediately. And and the biggest temptation that a person that receives this kind of of material blessing from the Lord or just in life is the tendency to forget the Lord. That's that's what this chapter eight is. Remember, 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 do not forget. Now, in chapter uh, in, in verse 10, which we looked at last week, but I was racing at that particular point in time. 
And I just want to talk about that just a little bit before we move on. He said, when you have eaten and are full, you're just going to be great. You're going into this land. It's going to be something. Then you shall bless the Lord your God. Thank him for the good land which he has given to you. And he warns them when they get into this promised land and they are immediately prospered. He said, don't forget to be thankful. Don't forget to be thankful. One of the sure um, signs that when a person is God blesses them with some level of prosperity. Again, it can be spiritual. It can be a spiritual influence and a calling that God has on a person's life or something like that. But we talk about material here for the moment. One of the sure signs, because we all face it. What, uh, on, on some level or another. And again, I want to kind of go back. We think, well, I, I'm not prosperous. What are you talking about? I'm, we live paycheck to paycheck and this and that. You know, Listen, if you've got a refrigerator in your house, if you've got a dishwasher in your house, if you've got a, a clothes uh, washer and a, and a clothes dryer, you've got a hot water heater, you've got five servants. You had to hire people to do all that stuff years ago. So we're richer than we realize. Even even in the culture, it, it is simplest places in, in the culture. And so one of the things is if I'm walking along as a Christian in my Christian life and all of a sudden I realize I am not expressing thanksgiving to God for his blessings, then I need to stop and I need to pull myself up and I got to ask myself. And the question I got to ask myself is. Do I think all of these blessings that are coming into my life are coming into my life because God is blessing me and thus should be thanked? Or do I think all of these blessings are a result of my own smarts, my own hard work, my own ingenuity? And when a person thinks this life that I live as a Christian is a result of my smarts, my ingenuity, my stick to my determination. One of the things they'll stop doing is thanking God. And so it's a bad sign when there ceases to be thanksgiving coming out of our life toward God, because we're starting to see our blessings is being generated from us. And then he gets into verse 11, the second thing danger and and sign that we're no longer that we've forgotten God. We're no longer seeing God as the source of blessings in our life. He said, beware. That's a strong word, isn't it? Beware that you do not forget the Lord, your God, by not keeping his commandments, his judgments, his statutes, which I command you today. Lest when you have eaten and are full and you have beautiful houses and dwell in them, and when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and your gold are multiplied and all that you have is multiplied. And so the second sign that he gives of a person who is being prospered by God but is losing track of the fact that God is the source of the prosperity is we start to disobey him. We start to become casually disobedient in our life. I'm not talking about trying as hard as we can and we slip up over here and I wish I wouldn't have said that to you know her this morning and I wish I had done this over here and, and those kind of things where we're just kind of growing in Christ likeness. But where a person starts to settle into a lifestyle where they just deliberately disregard God's commandments and decide, I'm not going to do what God wants me, tells me to do here. I'm going to do what I want to do. What that, what that speaks of, of that kind of person is that person no longer realizes that they need to be on the right side of God and his commandments in order for blessings to continue in their life. And so what they're really saying is, I don't believe the prosperity in my life comes from God at all. I believe, again, that it comes from my own smarts, my own hard work, my own talent and, and my own long hours and, and these kinds of things. Because nobody who thinks that their blessings are coming from God and that God is blessing them because their obedience is allowing God to bless them as much as he is will ever Settle down into a life of disobedience because, you know, you'll force all of that blessing to dry up. So two things for us just to stop in our own lives tonight, our own Christian lives, because it can happen to all of us. You know, you a, a person person doesn't have to have five million dollars to uh, 
to succumb to this kind of stuff. Uh, there's a certain kind of person that if they get twenty five dollars, they'll go crazy and, and do these things. So we have to just stop and pull back and just ask ourselves, it, am I is my life characterized by a regular ongoing thanksgiving directed to God for everything that he has blessed me with in my life? And then number two has a. Casual, a life of kind of casual disobedience to the different commandments of God, has that become characteristic of my life? And if that's the case, then I'm on the wrong road, and what happens is things start to dry up and it gets very, very messy. So we just catch ourselves at the symptom level here, and, and you know, and just the, what the Lord says here gets our attention. He said in verse 14, when your heart is lifted up, And you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who led you from that great and terrible, through that great and terrible wilderness, and which were fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty land where there was no water, who brought you, God did all of these things for your life. He got you out of Egypt. He took you through the wilderness. He brought you to the promised land, who brought water for you out of the flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna, which your uh, fathers did not know. Know, that he might humble you, that he might test you to do you good in the end. And then you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gained me this wealth. Another, uh, another characteristic of a person that is in danger of really forgetting that all of the blessings in our life as a child of God, that they come from God, is the person who forgets what we were before we came to know the Lord. And what Moses is basically saying to these people is, if it weren't for God, ladies and gentlemen, you would still be in Egypt. And if it weren't for God, you would have never survived the wilderness. In other words, the only explanation for your survival, let alone your prosperity, in the light of your history, is how good God has been to you. And I think it's good for us to remember as God prospers us in, in our Christian lives, however he chooses to do that, is to never forget what we were and who we were before God came into our lives. Because we would still be that person, only worse. And so it keeps us. I don't know about you. I don't want to be what I used to be. I don't know of anybody, nobody's written me a letter and said, boy, I really liked you before you came to know Christ. Wish you were more like that again. Does it happen? So here's this reminder. If it weren't for the Lord, we wouldn't have any of the blessings that we have. We'd still be in the bondage of Egypt and in the desert of the wilderness. And so that temptation to say in my heart, nobody will say it out loud. (laughs) There in verse 7, we're too spiritual for that. Yeah, you see all of this stuff that I got over here is my house and all this and all these things and all. It's my own power and my, and, and my own might of my hand has done that. I mean, we know enough not to say that. People kind of boo us. But I'll tell you, we, we can say it in our heart. Is this not the great Babylon that I have built? Nebuchadnezzar spent the next year and three quarters living like an animal out in the wilderness. God knows how to humble uh, people on, on that. And, and so he says, uh, verse 18, and you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers, as it is this day. So you say, wait a second. I'm a hard worker. I work hard where I work. And I've been promoted because of the hard work and all these different things and all. And I work harder than 90% of the people that I I work with and all. And so what about that? What about the hard work? What about that and what I'm willing to invest in, in, you know, for the glory of God and all these things? I mean, isn't there there something about, uh, you you know, doesn't something come out of my might and my hard, my power? Yeah, it does. But we have to remember that God gives us our next breath. He gives us the might. 
He's, he has created us. He's given us physical strength. He's given some of you greater physical strength than the rest of us. He's given you some of you. He's given greater mental abilities than others of us. He's given you expertise in uh, things that like to, to listen. If if it ever depended on me for a computer to ever be invented, I. They're invented, and I don't know anything more than the start button on them and, and how to get frustrated when they malfunction. This doesn't happen that often. But, but we're, we're all different. But God has made us different. And God has given us the talents and the abilities that he has given us, and he gives us our very next breath. We are dependent on him. He gives us the power to get wealth. He takes away what he is. The Bible says Jesus holds the whole universe together. He holds the atoms together. He holds the nucleuses together. We would just be, you know, individually, we'd be splintered out in a billion different directions apart from God holding us together. And then it shall be, verse 19, if by any means, then it shall be, if you by any means forget the Lord your God and follow other gods and serve them and worship them. I testify against you this day, you shall surely perish. As the nations which the Lord destroys before you, so you shall perish because you would not be obedient to the voice of the Lord your God. So God is is speaking to them. and, And again, we see that when God moved these other nations out of the promised land, it wasn't because he was a racist or he d- disliked liked one group of people more than another and he hated one group of people more than another, that kind of thing. God spoke to Israel and said, if you come into this land and you do the same shenanigans that these people are doing, I'll get you out of here too. You'll perish too. He's no respecter of persons. And, and so here is the, the danger there in verse 19 and 20 where of self-confidence that then turns into pride. Pride leads to forgetting the Lord, which then leads to idolatry, the worship of junk, the worship of stuff, which then leads to judgment, which then leads to the loss of everything. And it happens all of the time in the body of Christ and among God's people. God knows how to bless us and knows how to bring great things into our life. And then, like any father, he he knows when he sees that is now becoming self-destructive, he knows how to pull it back to humble us. And so there's the warning. Don't fall into idolatry, the worship of the creation rather than the creator when you become prosperous. Now, these are good warnings. I hope I'm not the only one that is tempted by these kinds of things. That's very helpful to hear the symptoms of, wow, you're heading down the wrong path here on this stuff so that uh, we can be right with the Lord. And then in uh, chapter 9, the Lord uh, Moses said, to them, Hear, O Israel, you are to cross over the Jordan today and go in to dispossess nations greater and mightier than yourselves. Cities great and fortified up to the heaven, a people tall, great and tall, the descendants of the Anakim, whom you know and of whom you have heard. Who can stand before the descendants of Anak? Now, remember the first generation. They found out about all of this when the 12 spies went into the promised land and they saw all this great fruit. The land is everything that God said it was, everything he's promised it to be. But man, he didn't tell us anything about these cities. They got big cities there. They got walls of these cities that go way up into the heavens. They got giants. They got people that are so big. I mean, they're they're like the Olympic basketball team. They just squash you as soon as look at you. And we're going to go in and fight against them. They put fear in in the hearts of God's people. And, And the problem is, is that all those nations have had 40 years to make the walls higher and to get better nutrition and have kids that are even bigger than the parents for giants in the land. So Moses comes in and says, listen, in in essence here, he says, I don't want what you're going to face in the land. I don't want that to surprise you when you walk into the land. And uh, and so he gives them the same report that the that the twelve, the ten of the twelve spies gave the first time. Yeah, you're going to go in. It's going to be tough. There's very big cities there. There's big walls in those cities and there's big, tough people in that land. And, and they're firmly entrenched. 
But what Moses does that was different from the 12 spies who brought the evil report and they undermine the faith of God's people is he comes in now and he encourages encourages them in God. Yes, it's all of that. It's as big and messy and dirty and fearsome as all of that. Therefore, understand today. Here's the solution to it. Verse three, that the Lord your God is he who goes over before you. Oh, we follow him. How good of a battle plan is that? Oh, that's better than the Fantastic Four all put together, isn't it? I'm not talking about the new ones. I'm talking about the old comic books. I don't know what they're doing today. So don't write me a letters about what kind of sins they're committing and how could I encourage the movie. Boy, did you see that thing in the paper yesterday? But that pastor dressing up is a okay. We won't go there. We're in a holy Bible here tonight. On things, what are we thinking? Good grief! So therefore, back to the Bible. Therefore, understand today that the Lord your God is He who goes before you. We never go anywhere in this life except He's gone before us, and He goes before us. If it couldn't be better, as a consuming fire. And he will destroy them and bring them down before you. So you shall drive them out and destroy them quickly as the Lord has said to you. Yeah, they're big. Yeah, they're tough. Yeah, they're seasoned. Yeah, they've been there a long time. But God is on your side. And you're not even going to have to lead. He'll lead. You just follow him into the battle. How do we follow him? Just obey his word. Do not think in your heart after the Lord your God has cast them out. You're going to have victory. This is not, but now here's the temptation that you're going to face when God that gives you this great victory. Do not think in your heart after the Lord, your God has cast them out before you, saying, because of my righteousness, the Lord has brought me in to possess this land. Does God know us or what? God gives us a great victory and the enemies are defeated and we come into this place by faith and all. And then somehow there's this weird little thing that can come into our mind and think, yeah, you know, I, God did that. But, you know, maybe he doesn't do that for everybody. Maybe he does it for people like me. Because I'm smarter and better than the average bear. And we begin to think there must be something that God has seen in me. Finally, someone has seen the virtue in me that makes me better than everyone else. I'm a little more this, a little more that, a little more holy, a little more obedient, a little more of this, and that's why this victory has occurred. Now we move from grace. It's not because God's been gracious to us or or that, or his power, now somehow I've worked my self-righteousness into it. In other words, this idea that God has done this something, and, and we deserve this something, this victory, this blessing, because of our own goodness, or because of our own godliness. And, I, and it's a real temptation that comes in. I know it's not really true of me, I know it's true of Tom. Uh, he t- we talk a lot about this. I don't know what he's talking about when he's saying it, but... But there is that, that temptation because of my own righteousness. And then notice what, what Moses does to burst that bubble. He said, but it is because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is driving out before you. That's the real reason that uh, you have had this victory here. And, and uh, it's not because you're so great, you're so righteous. It just happens he was moving out a, 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 m- a more wicked group of people uh, than you. So that would be the explanation. And then it's not because he said, um, verse 5, of your righteousness or your uprightness in your heart that you go in to possess the land. Really, it's not? Hmm. But because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord your God uh, drives them out from before you and that he may fulfill the word which the Lord spoke to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And so God says, I'm blessing you and I'm, I'm giving you this land, not because you're such super duper people, but because the people that are in the land are worse than you. And also because I promised Abraham, Isaac and Jacob that I would do it and I keep my word and therefore understand that the Lord your God is not giving you this good land to possess because of your righteousness. Now, this is, how many times has he got to say it? Does he know what he's dealing with or what? 
It's about the third time I start to get it. Okay, he's, you found, is, it, is there, does there seem to be like a pattern here? So it's not because of our righteousness. And then in case they missed it, this is for like remedial. And I, I get, for you are a stiff necked people. That's known as clarity in communication. Stiff necked person is a rebellious person. He said, you're, you, it's not because of your righteousness. You folks are a, a stiff necked, rebellious people. And who knew better than Moses? Now, he's been dealing with them for a long, long time. Then he said in the verse 7, remember, this is what they need to remember, do not forget how you provoke the Lord your God to wrath in the wilderness. You got the nicest, most gracious, kindest, most loving God, and you people were able to provoke even him to wrath. So no wonder why I got mad with you. But anyway, uh, I mean, what does it take to provoke God Almighty to wrath? They did it. From the day that you entered, uh, departed from the land of Egypt until you came to this place, you have been rebellious against the Lord. So, man, sometimes you just need somebody to be clear. And Moses is just about as, as clear as can be. And it was true. They've been nothing but rebellious, disobedient complainers from the time of of Egypt. And so he reviews that and he says, Rem- remember that. And then now in verse eight, he's going to give them examples from their history of of this. He's laid down this kind of, uh, you know, a proposition. You've been nothing but rebellious from day one. And now he's going to give them examples of it in case they wanted to argue with him. He said also in Horeb. You provoked the Lord to wrath so that the Lord was angry enough with you to have destroyed you. This is talking about Exodus chapter 32, the golden calf incident. Moses goes up on the the mountain to receive the law, and they make a golden calf to worship instead of worshiping God. So he reminds them, he says, you want some proof of whether you are self-righteous and you deserve the the grace that God's bringing in your life? Let me give you a little bit of of a, a history Lesson. So this is going to be Moses's and God's cure for any self-righteousness or any pride in God's people all the way down through the ages. And that is all God would have to do, not only for the children of Israel, all he'd have to do for any one of us in this room. We start to think it's because we're the best, we're the greatest, there must be something about me. All God has to do with any of us is sit down and say, let me give you a history lesson. You seem to have forgotten some things that I haven't forgotten. Thankfully, they're under the blood. But this is uh, someone has said that humility is made up of two ingredients, honesty and a good memory. And it's true. So Moses is going to be honest with them and he's going to remind them uh, of, of their past. And so he's just keep, he's, he's going to remind them of all of this. And I'll tell you again, that's enough to keep any of us. Uh, humble. I mean, every one of us has, has repaid God's delivering us from Egypt and uh, cleaning up our lives. We've repaid that with an obedience that has been uh, less than perfect. And so God is going to Moses is going to humble them. He's going to speak to them these things. So it keeps them humble. Now, you ever had God knock you off your high horse? He's good at that. And And it's one of the most wonderful things that he does because pride is one of the most high maintenance lives that a person can live. The pride, one of the uh, translations of the word pride in the New Testament is to see myself above. And if I see myself above you and then pretty soon I see myself above God, which is what disobedience is. If I see myself above you, then I'm going to feel a constant pressure to prove that I'm better than you. And since intrinsically I'm not, that's a very high maintenance kind of, of life. And so God just humbles us and he frees us from that and say, we're a sinner saved by grace. So he reminds them of Horeb and he's going to go into some detail. He's going to remind them. So they're going to need an argument from him. When I went up into the mountain to receive the tablets of stone, the tablets of the covenant, which the Lord made with you, 
And then I stayed on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. I ate neither bread nor drank water. And so he's, he's talking here of, of how he left them down below with Aaron. He went up to receive the law from, from God a period of 40 days. And then the Lord delivered to me two tablets of stone written with the finger of God. And on them were all the words which the Lord had spoken to you on the mountain from the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. And it came to pass at the end of 40 days and 40 nights that the Lord gave me the two tablets of stone, the tablets of the covenant, talking about the Ten Commandments. And then the Lord said to me, Arise, go down quickly from here, for your people whom you brought out of Egypt have acted corruptly. Most, my people? What's this? You? My? You, these are your... It's funny all the way through. They're, nobody wants to claim them for a while. This is one of those times. And they've turned aside... Uh, from the way in which I commanded them, they have made themselves a molded image. Moses, you leave for 40 days and they're making golden calves down there and dancing half naked around them. I don't believe it. Furthermore, the Lord spoke to me saying, I have seen this people and indeed they are stiff necked people. Let me alone that I may destroy them and blot out their name from under heaven, and I will make of you a nation mightier and greater, greater than they. And so I turned, I came down from the mountain, and the mountain burned with fire, and the, and the two tablets of the covenant, they were in my two hands. And I looked, and behold, you had sinned against the Lord your God, and you had made for yourselves a molded calf. And you had turned aside quickly from the way which the Lord had commanded you. It didn't take you any time to begin to disobey the Lord. And then I took the two tablets of, of stone with the Ten Commandments on them. I threw them out of my two hands. He threw them to the ground and broke them before your eyes. And he, Moses threw the tablets down and he, he broke those ten, ten, uh, the, the tablets, the two tablets of the Ten Commandments, because they had already broken at least two of them in, in what they were doing as it was a demonstration of what he was seeing with his eyes. And I fell down before the Lord as at the first 40 days and 40 nights. I neither ate bread nor drank water because of all your sin, which you committed in doing wickedly in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. For I was afraid of the anger and hot displeasure which, with which the Lord was angry with you to destroy you. But the Lord listened to me at that time also. Moses is saying, you have no idea how close you folks came to just being completely wiped out. It, it looked a little touch and go for a while. The Lord was very angry with Aaron, would have destroyed Aaron. That's an insight we have here that we didn't have in Exodus. So I prayed for Aaron also at the same time. And then I took your sin, and he calls the calf your sin, the calf which you had made. I burned it with fire, crushed it, ground it until it was very small, until it was fine as dust. I threw its dust into the brook that descended from the mountain. And so he reminds them of their, their failure in Mount Horeb where they had made uh, even God, they had made God so angry there that God was wanting uh, to destroy them. In other, in other words, their existence, their continued existence was a testimony, not of their own self-righteousness, but of the grace and the patience of God. He said also it's at Tabera, which is one of the many places, talks about Numbers chapter 11, verses 1 through 3, one of the many places where they complained against the Lord for one reason or another. And at that particular incident, God sent fire down from heaven and he wiped out a group of them that were kind of working the edges of the camp with, with the complaining. Also, it uh, uh, Massa, where uh, Exodus chapter 17, where Moses struck the rock for the first time for water to come forth to them. But again, this was all because of their whining and their complaining and their rebellion against God. He mentions Kibroth uh, Hatava, uh, where you provoke the Lord to wrath. Uh, all of those places provoked him to wrath, but also Kibroth Hatava. That was where they were saying, We don't like man anymore. We want me. We want meat. We want meat. What are you going to sit there? We're going to go back to Egypt unless you give us meat. Moses, we're going to kill you and Aaron unless you give us meat. God goes, God, look what they're doing. They're stiff necked, rebellious people. And so God says, All right, they want meat. I'll give them meat. He sends in quail, and they've got quail. They've got to get more quail than they can eat, and they're stuffing their mouths with it until it's coming out of their nostrils. And then the Lord said, A plague with the quail. 
and I wiped a portion of them out that there were the complainers uh, in the camp. And then the place got named Kibroth Hathava, which means the graves of lust. And then he mentions Kadesh Barnea, verse 23. Likewise, when the Lord sent you from Kadesh Barnea, saying, go up and possess the land which I have given you. And then you rebelled against the commandment of the Lord your God and did not believe him nor obey his word. And this is the incident with the 12 spies who came back, 10 of them with an evil report. And the people refused to obey God to take the promised land and, and the conquest of it. 40 years earlier. And, uh, and then as he's laid all of this uh, out, you have been rebellious against the Lord from the day that I knew you. I think he'd like to say that. I think he liked saying that to them. And that, and that was the truth. So the, what that verse kind of indicates is that Moses could have continued on indefinitely laying out you know, one example or another of, of their rebellion, which had, uh, uh, had angered the Lord. Now, having gone through their history, it's kind of like what Moses is doing is he's saying, OK, this is what you've been from day one all the way till today. And, and the idea is now, does anyone want to, you know, peep up and say that this had anything to do with your righteousness. Do you think the land that you have, the promises that you have, the land that you're about to possess is on the basis of your righteousness and, and your goodness? Or is this all based on the grace of God? And of course, it was all based upon the grace of God. And so here is Moses. He's, he's laid out this kind of a watertight argument concerning the, uh, just showing how absurd it would be for Israel ever to suppose that we are going into this land, receiving the blessings of this land because of our own self-righteousness. Sometimes um, you'll talk with someone and, uh, and talk about the Lord and this kind of deal and heaven. And, and uh, sometimes you'll, as you're talking with someone, they'll say, yeah, absolutely, I'm on the way. I'm going to heaven. You know, I'm an American. So, of course, I'm going to go to heaven. It's a Christian nation. Export evil all over the world, you know, no worse than anybody else probably. And, but in some respects it is. But, I mean, this is not a Christian nation. It has a Christian heritage, as I wouldn't call it a Christian nation uh, today. And, but sometimes I think, you know, when I get up there in heaven, you know, and, and stand before St. Peter, you won't. But, but that's how they think of it a little bit. And, uh, and St. Peter says, you know, why should I let you in? And you should let me in because I've been a good person all of my life. I've been better than most. And, and, uh, and for grading on a class curve, you, you should let me in. And so, and, and so trying to deal with God on the basis of self-righteousness. You know all God has to do to cure that? That's pride. I, get in, I, can get it, I can barge my way into heaven on the basis of my history. All God has to do is say, run the film. <laughs> the film, the video, the DVD, or whatever they're using up there by the time we get up there. All right, you're so self-righteous, you've got to wait. Okay, just run it. And then have the guy stand there and watch it. Wait a second. I was only in the second grade there. We're starting early here. You, you're you good early at this. You're going to show that. Ah, 23 years old. You're not going to show that year, are you? You know, They just shut all of our mouths up. <laughs> There's none righteous, the Bible says. No, not, no, not one. And so none of us would ever want to have our history that only God knows to be run in front of the whole world. We are a testimony to God's grace. It's not our self-righteousness. It's not our greatness. So what does that produce within us? Thanksgiving. A desire to obey him in the big things and the small things as a way to say thank you to him. And it keeps us in, in, the, in that kind of a life that he's, that he's called us to. And so the only reason they hadn't been wiped out was... Because of, of God's grace. And thus I prostrated myself, uh, prostrated myself before the Lord. Forty days and forty nights I kept prost, 
uh, trading myself because the Lord had said he would destroy you. So Moses spent the next 40 days just praying and interceding for them that God wouldn't wipe them out. And we get a pretty, this is a very intimate kind of glimpse at what was happening between Moses and God. We don't have this much kind of clarity uh, from the Exodus account. And therefore I prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord God, do not destroy your people and your inheritance whom you have redeemed through your greatness, whom you have brought out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Do not look on the stubbornness of this people, nor on their wickedness or on their sin, lest the land from which you brought us should say, because the uh, Lord was not able to bring them to the land which he promises them, and because he hated them, he has brought them out to kill them in the wilderness. Yet they are your people and your inheritance whom you brought out by your mighty power and by your outstretched arm. And so Moses was pleading with the Lord and saying, Lord, don't not wipe them out on the basis of their righteousness. That's no, uh, that's no argument to move heaven. He said, don't wipe them out, number one, because you're a gracious God, and number two, because they are your people. And then number three, so it doesn't create confusion among the nations. And they, they might think that it was a failure of God's power that they did not go into the promised land rather than a failure of the people. And then he said, bring them in simply because you promised the patriarchs. So there's no self-righteousness in, in uh, 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 any of it. Chapter 10, and at that time the Lord said to me, hew for yourself two tablets of stone. So he continues the whole account. Two tablets of stone, like the first, and come up to me on the mountain and make yourself an ark of wood. So when God uh, wrote the Ten Commandments with his own finger, the first set of the Ten Commandments, he hewed the stone and then he wrote it. The second time, Moses is instructed now to hew the stones, to bring them up uh, to the Lord on the mountain, also to make an ark of wood. And I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets which you broke, and you shall put them in the ark. And so the, first, the second set was identical to the first set, all Ten Commandments. And so Moses said, I make an, made an ark of acacia wood, hewed two tablets of stone like the first, and went up uh, the mountain having the two tablets in my hand. And he wrote on the tablets according to the first writing of the Ten Commandments, which the Lord had spoken to you on the mountain from the midst of the fire in the day of the ascent. And the Lord gave them to me. And then I turned and I came down from the mountain and put the, uh, the, two, the set of the tablets, the second set, in the ark which I had made. And there they are, just as the Lord had commanded me, referring to the ark of the covenant that was, uh, that was ultimately built. And, the, and on this time of this, uh, giving this Teaching, they were uh, very much inside the Ark of the Covenant. Now, in verse 6, you've got what's called a parenthetical statement where the Lord uh, just kind of gives us some uh, information that helps us understand what it is that we're in the middle of. And basically, in verses uh, 6, let's see how far it goes here. Yeah, 6 through verse 9, it, it's just basically God saying to them, uh, the existence of the priesthood, the existence of the high priest is all because of, of God's uh, grace. Now, the children of Israel journeyed from the wells of uh, Beni uh, Jaka Akan. Uh, well, uh, Ja Akan. OK, got that? It's not Shaka Khan. It's Ja Akan uh, to Moserah where uh, Aaron died and where he was buried. And Eliezer, his son, ministered as priest in his stead. And from there they journeyed to... Um, listen, I'm over one here. On that, uh, uh, good God. Uh, that, okay, so... Sounds like a lot of things, doesn't it? So they went from there uh, to uh, Jotbetha, the river, the land of rivers of water. And at that time, the Lord separated the tribe of Levi to bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, to stand before the Lord, to minister to him and to bless his name to this day. And therefore, Levi has no portion nor inheritance with his brethren. And the Lord, the Lord 
is his inheritance, just as the Lord your God promised him. Again, the point that Moses is making here is you wouldn't even have a priesthood. You wouldn't even have a high priest that you enjoy today without the grace of God. And as the first time I stayed in the mountain 40 days and 40 nights, the Lord also heard me at that time. And the Lord chose not to destroy you. And then the Lord said to me, arise, begin your journey before the people that they may go in and possess the land which I swore to their fathers to give to them. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? So he's Moses is a very, very good teacher. He knows he's laid out a lot of doctrine to these folks. And there's been a lot of points to what he's saying. So now he's just going to kind of encapsulate it into one or two sentences to help them remember what's really important, what what he's been driving home in all of this. So now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? Number one, but to fear the Lord your God, to have reverence for him and to walk in all his ways, be obedient to him and to love him. And and then number four, to serve the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all all of your soul and to keep the commandments of the Lord uh, and his statutes, which I command you today for your good. Every commandment in the Bible is for our good. It's for our good. Take any commandment of God in the Bible. Look anywhere in the world where that commandment is being openly and wildly violated and witness the bad that comes out of it. Every command that God gives is for our good. Indeed, heaven and the highest of heavens belong to the Lord your God, also the earth with all that is in it. The Lord delighted only in your fathers to love them, and he chose their descendants after them. You above all peoples as it is this day, therefore circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be stiff-necked no more. And, and what the circumcision represented for the Jew was a covenant that God made with the Jews through Abraham. And what it represented, it was a physical thing that was to re- represent a spiritual thing in their lives. And that was that they were not to live for the flesh, but that they were to live for the spirit. And what happened is over time, they were getting physically circumcised, but their hearts and their minds were completely dominated by the flesh. And so Moses is coming in and Moses is saying to them, listen, that's not why God gave circumcision. He gave circumcision as a physical thing to remind you on a regular basis. And that would remind you on a regular basis that you're to be a spiritual people who don't live for the flesh. And, and so but they had taken it and said, well, we've been physically circumcised, so we must be all right with God. Now, one of the great things is, is for us as Christians, I mean, a person can be circumcised or uncircumcised doesn't matter as, as a Christian. But Paul does write about the circumcision of our hearts. And, you, and so you, where you had physical circumcision in the Old Testament that reminded people that they were different from everyone else in the world and that they were to be a spirit and a God dominated people, not a flesh dominated people in the new covenant. In the New Testament, for us as Christians, we have a much better reminder. And the better reminder we have is the Holy Spirit inside of us. I don't know about you. He doesn't let me get away with much. If I look left and I'm supposed to be looking right, or I look right and I'm supposed to be looking left, and I don't even know where my fingers are going. And I, and I say this or this or this, and he talks to me fast. And he reminds me that, you know, being a Christian isn't just a title that's put on and the whole thing. But this is, this is a, you, you need to obey me here in this from the heart. So we, we got better things in, in, in Jesus. And so uh, he said, this is what you need. You need to be a people that are dominated by God. From your heart and not be rebellious any longer. For the Lord your God is God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome. So, wow. You read that. You think, Morgan, our youngest daughter, 
She would sometimes come home from children's church years ago, and there was that song. I assume that it's still being sung. I hope it is. You know, my God is so big, so strong, and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. The veins would be coming out of her neck. You know, no whole excitement and everything. Say, preach it, sister. You know, but. Um, you know, you read this and it reminds me of that. What well, it kind of reminds me of that. Right? The Lord your God is a God of gods, the Lord of... I'm going to huff and I'm going to puff and I'm going to... I mean, wow! So here's Moses talking about, this is your God. He's so big and he's this. And Okay, what are we supposed to do about it? He tells us. He said, who shows no partiality and takes no bribe. And you got this great... Powerful, gigantic, wonderful God. What's important to him? Treat everybody the same. Because that's how he treats them. Whether they're rich, whether they're poor, whether they're powerful, whether they're powerless. You can't bribe him. He does right and he does no matter what a person is or what a person isn't and, and all. And so you want to. Be in line with the greatness of this God, the Lord of Lords, the God of Gods, and all of this. Treat everyone in a righteous way, in an, in an equal way. Wow. I'd have thought he was going to ask us to, you know. No, so, sometimes it's the things that we kind of look and say, well, that's a small thing. James brings the same thing out, doesn't he? Talks to us about a church people and say, well, you know, you got the poor person comes in and say, all right, we got, I think we can set a chair up in the back for you. Somebody comes in, they got rings and robes and the whole deal. And they go, well, hey, clear the front. I mean, we'll get you right up here in the front. Now nobody wants to be in the front. They want to be in the back. But anyway, these are the problems we have today. I'm just kidding. But he said, aren't you showing partiality? And the point he's making is God isn't partial that way. He, 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 and he, it's a do right to everyone. And then he administers justice for the fatherless and the widow. Loves the stranger, giving him food and clothing. In other words, take care of the, the vulnerable in society. In those days, when you were a foreigner in another land, you were, could just be ripped off. And you're very vulnerable to the native population. And he said, these people are the most vulnerable to being ripped off in, in your culture. Most vulnerable in society. You take care of them. Why? Because that's what your big God of gods and Lord of lords is like. These things are important to me, too. Therefore, love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. God says, when you do that, you're being like me. And not only are you being like me, you're being like I've already been to you in your life. And you shall fear the Lord your God and shall serve him. And, uh, and to him you shall hold fast and take oaths in his name. He is your praise. He is your God who has done for you these great things, these great and awesome things which your eyes have seen. Your fathers went down to Egypt with 70 people. And now the Lord your God has made you as the stars of heaven in multitude on the basis of what? Self-righteousness? No. On the basis of his grace and his faithfulness. And I think it's a wonderful thing to think about as we introduce the communion tonight, the symbols of Jesus' body and of his blood this evening, the cracker, a symbol of his, of his body, and the cup and the grape juice, a symbol of his blood. So as we began earlier tonight, Moses exhorted the children of Israel, don't forget and remember to remember, God, Moses said to the children of Israel, remember how God has saved us. Remember how God has cleaned us up. Remember how God has blessed us. And then don't forget when you remember all those things to say thank you to him. Jesus spoke in the New Testament concerning the Lord's Supper. And he said... Do this in remembrance of me. To take some time. He can get forgotten. To take some time and just to freshly remember how he saved us. How he cleaned us up. I know it's a project and he's still at it. But he's done a lot. How it is that he has blessed us 
and then to take the time to give him thanks this evening, to remember what we would still terribly be tonight apart from his grace. And I think that sometimes we can forget that a real, historical, personal Jesus died on the cross and it was real blood that flowed down from his head and down from his, his, uh, his hands and from his feet to the ground below in order to die on that cross in order for us to enjoy the life that we enjoy tonight as Christians. So it's a time for us just to say thanks to him this evening. And to say thank you, Lord, that because we are in Christ Jesus, you will never roll the video on our lives. That the blood of Jesus Christ is greater than any of our sins, all of our sins, greater than all of the sins of the whole world in human history. That's the power of his blood. That's the power of his life given for us on the cross. What a Savior we have tonight. So much to give thanks for. So if the men will come forward and the worship team will come forward, we will give him thanks as we partake of the symbols of his body and of his blood. We're going to pass the bread out first. And so if you would just take that, hold on to it, we will pray together and partake together. And then we'll do the same thing with the cup.